Before we begin with song service, I had my hand slapped a little bit in a nice way that because God's closet prep is tonight and God's closet is tomorrow, I was informed nicely by Marlene that it's not good enough to say check the dates. Uh, we, need, we need help tonight um, to set up. Uh, we expect a lot of people, a lot of volunteers um, to be involved in God's closet and we need to set up extra tables. So. Please, please note that, that it's tonight. We need you. Please come and help. Thanks. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. We're glad each one of you is here. And we also um, welcome our online viewers. And we're wanting to let you know that we miss you and we have plenty of room for you to come back. All right, let's open up our hymn books to number 192. It's our first song, and we also have that on our screen. 192. <laughs>
83 now. Oh, worship the king, hymn number 83. As the song says, Lord, we believe that you are in your holy temple. You're still on the throne. You still are in charge of things as messed up as they are down here in this world, in this day and age. And so here we come, Lord, to find peace, to find rest from the world. We thank you for your promise that when two or three are gathered, you are here in our midst. We claim that promise in Christ's name. Amen. Children's offering, lamb's offering. So Crystal Austin has our children's story that will follow our lamb's offering. I, I think probably most of you know about the lamb's offering. It's an offering we specially take up for uh, ministry to our children, uh, both here in this church and we have some mission children that we also contribute to. 
And so we'd like to um, I'll give you the opportunity to continue to contribute to that. So the children will be coming around with, with baskets um, to take up this offering. And then Crystal will give us the, the children's story. Good morning. I see we have two today. <laughs> but I've got a story today about a dog. Now, I know you have a dog, don't you? Or two? Three. You got three dogs. We have two dogs. Yeah. Anyway, dog stories are always good. I'll just start this one. Otis and Belle are neighbor dogs who play together every chance they get. Well, the title is called Bell in the Well. Okay. So, Otis and Bell are neighbor dogs. They play together every chance they can. They run through the fields. They swim in the pond. They play keep away with balls and sticks. If Otis gets let out before Bell, he runs up on her family's porch and looks in their kitchen window and whimpers until her family lets her out. One night, Belle didn't come when her family called for her. Where was Belle? For days, they called the animal shelter. They put up posters for lost dog, please call. And they kept looking. But no, Belle. All during this time, <coughs> Otis went to Belle's family's porch and whimpered or barked. They knew he missed his friend, but they didn't know he was trying to tell them something. Then on the fourth day that Belle was missing, just as her master came down the front steps, Otis grabbed hold of her jeans with his teeth. Otis led her across a field and over a hill to a stony place that turned out to be an old well. By now, the woman knew what she would find. There in the bottom of that dark well was Belle, shivering and hoarse from barking. Later, the rescuers came and they worked to free the dog and they discovered in the bottom of the well an old blanket and the fresh remains of a couple of rabbits in the well with Belle. Otis had dragged the blanket all the way from his family's house to help his friend stay warm. He probably caught the rabbits and dropped those in too so that she'd have something to eat. 
Otis is a true friend. He seems to know what love for others is all about. Today, you'll have a chance to help someone, too. Remember Otis and take that chance. Ask Jesus to help you know what to do to be a good friend. So let's try to be a good friend this week and in our lives in general. When we see someone in need, do what we can to help, just like Otis did. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the story of the dogs and how they encourage us to be a good friend and to look out for others. Thank you for our pets that you put in our lives and help us to be helpful to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think for any church to be successful, it needs to be a praying church. It's time now for prayer. I checked in our, our prayer book. Um, we don't have too many new um, additions to the book this week. Uh, someone has asked that we pray for our families and our marriages and, and all those things, um, which I think is important, um, especially in this day and age. The devil is just a constant attack. Uh, especially on people's homes and relationships. And so we, we ask that everybody make that a matter of prayer all through the week. I um, also like to pray for those, of course, who are sick, who aren't feeling well, who are discouraged, uh, the various uh, struggles that uh, any family deals with, the church families as well. Uh, we would ask that the Lord draw close to those. And we also, I think we should pray for God's closet. Um, we should pray for uh, the Mills family during this difficult time. Uh, so please join me as, as I kneel for prayer. With the, with the psalmist, we pray, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Lord, we bow before you in worship this morning because you're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be worshiped. We thank you for, for love, for all your gifts. Particularly, we are thankful for the gift of your son who has died to give us life. And Lord, we pray for this community in which we live and we pray for this world which we are a part. We pray, Lord, that this church will be a great light, bringing the light of God, the light of salvation to all those in this confused and troubled world who need you, who are, would be seeking you, who are seeking you. 
We ask, Lord, that you will turn us into those people who accurately portray your character. You said, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Teach us the proper way to lift you up. Lord, we pray for this church also that you'll be with those here who are hurting, be with the families, be with those who are sick, be with those who are uh, struggling with any of the particular trials that we're prone to. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will draw close and that your power will heal and fix and change lives. We pray, Lord, now also for the message that we're about to receive, that it not be uh, just a a casual message, but it will be the message, the precise message that you have for your people this morning. I ask, Lord, that you will bless Pastor Ferguson, that you will anoint his lips with coals from the altar. Pray, Lord, you'll also anoint our ears that what we hear um, will be meet in due season, and that we'll apply what we hear and what you bring to us um, into our lives. We pray, Lord, that you will bless God's closet. We pray, Lord, that you will bless the school. We pray, Lord, that you will be with the, the financial situation with the church. Uh, we pray, Lord, especially in this time of, of, of sorrow, that you will be with the Mills family. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all you do. We ask, Lord, you'll forgive us for our sins. For his, Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. As the deacons are getting ready to take up the offering, I just would like to, to thank Ashley for being a part of our service and reading the scripture that will follow. I uh, also like to thank, I don't know, I was going to say the Williams, but that doesn't work. Uh, I thank our song leaders this morning for their contribution. I'd like to thank uh, Elder Ferguson for being here with us. Um, we we'll always look forward to hearing from you. Um, I remember several years back when my family was, were members at the Hendersonville Church and, and he was the senior pastor. We always look forward to the sermons, but I, I quite often was on the sound booth and I, I always got a, a great blessing out of Pastor Ferguson's love for music. And, and when you're running sound, you had to always be on your toes because he could burst forth in singing just about at any time. And I used to remember he'd, he'd, be, he'd be leading song, closing song or whatever, and uh, if you watched his foot, he was always keeping time. I used to, used to give him a hard time about that, said that that wasn't allowed in church, but uh, he, he, he never paid any attention to that. But uh, I think one of the... One of the greatest things we can do for our young people with the music struggles that we have is to show how much we enjoy singing the hymns that God has, has put in our path. And so we had an opening in song service today, and, and Pastor Ferguson has, has volunteered to fill that. So we would also like to thank him for stepping up to that. So, so the service will proceed uh, without announcement, um, now with scripture reading. Our scripture this morning is Romans 9, 30 through 33. Romans 9, 30 through 33. What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word.
It's a pleasure to be here. I think this is the third, uh, the first time that uh, I have preached here since COVID hit, and that's way too long. Uh, I I tell you, this stuff just seems to keep reinventing itself. So we've decided we're going to go on anyhow, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but we love you guys. It's, uh, we've seen this church flourish in the last 20 years and uh, grow in your school. I, we have a number of Hendersonville kids here. Our pastor sends his, his children here to, as you know, Pastor Wright and Elizabeth to uh, uh, the Mills River School. And uh, we were here for graduation. It was exciting this year to, to see this church packed full and so enthusiastic about Christian education. My parents had just become Seventh-day Adventists when I was born, and they wanted me to have um, a uh, Christian education in the Adventist school. Um, what you see, I don't know if you can see, yeah, you can see it. Uh, that's the church that was built in Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up. The Roebuck Church on the east side of town. I lived in East Lake, right next to Roebuck, and that's the Roebuck Seventh Day Adventist Church in front of you on the screen. I was uh, in the first grade when they built that church. Interesting. They built the school first, which is across the parking lot from it. 
You see, there was a, I didn't know I was going to tell you all this, but the spirit moveth where it will. And here's a story. There was a wealthy man who lived in a mansion on the property behind this church. And that wealthy man was a Roman Catholic. And the bishop looked forward to that Roman Catholic sending his children to the Roman Catholic school. But he heard about the Seventh-day Adventist school system, the largest parochial school system outside the Roman Catholic Church in the world. Did you know that? Yeah. And he wanted his children to go to a Roman, uh, not to a Roman Catholic, though he was Roman Catholic, he wanted them to go to an Adventist school. There wasn't one on the east side of town. So he gave the property for this church and school, which is basically in his front yard. And his, his daughter, Shem, Shem White, Mr. White was his name. That's the rest of the story. I've never told from the pulpit before. So I went to school here. And uh, I remember looking out the window after they built the school. We were going to school and looking. But, uh, uh, it was a one-room schoolhouse. Six grades. Somebody says, "How? that's ridiculous. How can a teacher teach six grades? She did it. And let me tell you, you say, well, did the first and second, third grades learn anything? Listen, by the time you get to the third grade, you've heard it twice before. <laughs> Teachers tell you, and I already knew how to do division. You know? It's, uh, I, I don't know. I've been completely through the system. Finally, they told me, enough, enough. You've been enough. But uh, I, I uh, tell you, it was a wonderful experience. I'm going to give a plug here for Christian education, the Adventist way, because it's been a blessing to our family. Um, but moving on with my story, <clears throat> I have not been to Birmingham, lived since I left, went off to high school. You know, you go to educational <clears throat> system, you, know, you go off to Bass Memorial Academy, if you're me, which is in Mississippi. And then I went to Southern Advent, it was a Southern Missionary College then, or <clears throat> some people among us call it Southern Matrimonial, right? <laughs> Sharon, Mary, you know about that. Yeah. <clears throat> and which is now Southern, what is it? Southern, I saw this sort of Southern Missionary to me. <laughs> Southern Adventist University? Yeah, okay. Then went on to Andrews University. So recently I had to make several trips, uh, seven trips actually in about three months to Birmingham. I have a special needs sister and she needed some help there, medical help and what have you. And, and she's doing fine, by the way. <clears throat> but uh, while you're there, you can't sit in hospitals all the time. And, and she had rehab. And so I decided that I would pick up some of the habits I picked up as a young man that are permissible. Maybe some would question whether they should be, but you see, across the street from this church, the church of my childhood, across the street is, is something called a golf course. I don't know. And <clears throat> this particular golf course had a lot of balls that would go across Highway 11 for some reason and end up in, my dad cut the grass for the church and he'd bring them home. And that got my interest going about that beautiful place across the, the road from the church and all those golf balls and we'd find when we were out playing in, in, in recess. And so that's the first place that I entered into a, a very, very unfavorable and disappointing career in golf. And, and, but that is what I have do and occasionally. Um, so I went to play golf one day. I'm not going to talk about golf anymore, except when you play golf, you know, I was by myself, and they tell you when to tee off. That means hit the ball and get started. And I was alone by myself, and there was a group in front of me, and there were two guys behind me. And I said, why don't you guys come join up with me? Then you don't have to wait on me. So I said, sure. And it was John and Todd. That's what you do. You introduce yourself. You shake their hands or bump hands now in this COVID day. And, and I found out that these guys were much better than I was. But uh, I sat hit from the senior tee, so that's way up and uh, gave me a little advantage. And so they, uh, after a while, you know, this is the way it usually goes when you're playing with strangers. They ask the question, so... Uh, are you retired? What do you do for a living? I said, I'm a fire insurance salesman. Yeah. <laughs> Think about that just a second. And uh, so they said, well, we are in this business, that business. And 
as time goes on, they say, so what kind of insurance is that? And I said, I'm a preacher, really. <laughs> oh, oh, I've been saying some words I shouldn't say around preacher. That's usually the way it goes. And I, and it opens up the door for conversation. So uh, John said, no, it was Todd said, uh, so I bet you don't know the first sermon that you ever preached. I said, I do. I most certainly do. In fact, you see that church over there? So you see that church right across the street from here? That church right there is a church I was, I was reared in. And I preached at 16 years of age. I preached in that church. And he said, well, I'll bet you don't remember exactly what you said. I said, I remember the scripture that I used that day. 16 years of age, my very first sermon. I do remember it. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of God? A temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? I said, I preached it with great vigor. Know ye not, ye are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16, twice it says that. Don't you know you're the temple of God? When God says something twice, he means it. And I told the people that. And he says, you really gave him fire and brimstone, didn't you? I said, I did. At 16 years of age, I told him that the Spirit of God dwells in us. And the Bible says that if we do not take care of this temple, that God will destroy us. 2 Corinthians 3.17. He says, my, you, there was no grace in that, was there? I said, as a matter of fact, some of the saints, they were very kind to me. They asked me to preach it that afternoon at a, at a smaller church. And I preached the same thing again. And in between, they said, you know, you can't do it all on your own. And I said, well, I understand that. Anything we do good, Jesus. So I threw that in the second time. <clears throat> But I mean, I preached, I said, if you smoke, if you drink, you're going to hell. I wasn't using hell in a, in a derogatory or, or an ugly way. I just told them. In fact, I, I even said, if you smoke and chew, and my, I had my grandmother dip snuff. I was concerned about that. I said, we're not going to heaven. And um, I said, if you drink coffee, it is taking light, days off your lives. And God will destroy you. And so they wrestled with me and with smiles on their faces and helped me to understand that Jesus saves, that we're not saved by works. But this started me on a journey. That, uh, that sermon started me on a journey of trying to understand the place of works and grace in the walk of the sinner, especially someone who is addicted to things that hurt us. How do we get the power to do it? Now, when I went to Southern Adventist University, I, um, I do remember going there. I signed up not for theology. I signed up for communications. I wanted to be a radio broadcaster like Joe Rumor of WVOK in Birmingham, Alabama, who played all the popular songs and and I wanted, to, I wanted to be a radio announcer. And so I took communications. I even worked in the radio uh, department there, uh, the communications department and the radio station at Southern. I remember I had to interview to work there. And uh, so you know, I'm straight from the South. This is before I've been in the Northwest and Northeast, and they tried to straighten out my accent and finally gave up. But they did help a little. It was something like this. This is the interview for the job. This is WSMC FM 90.7 on the FM dial in Collegedale, Tennessee, your better listening radio station. And they said, would you repeat that again? And so they copied that. I mean, they recorded it. And years later, I would meet guys that would hear me, and they'd say, you're that guy on that tape we had to listen to when I went to Southern. And they showed all the diphthongs and dropping your voice at the end of the sentence and what have you. And that became the example of what not to do. <laughs> but they let me work at the station. I could spin records and log in and what have you. And I learned. I got my first class broadcasting license. I learned how to get a radio station started. And, 
there are four stations in my ministry, in the time of my ministry, that we've been able to, to start with that little knowledge. And so God's hand was in it all. But every time I would sign up for a new semester, I would, uh, my, my counselor would tell me, have you considered being a pastor? And I said, I've thought about it, but I really want to be in radio work, communications work. And they said, yeah, but all your electives are in religion. And you're taking Greek. It's my second year. You're taking Greek. Uh, yeah, but that, you know, I, I just, I, I really was on a struggle to understand the Bible. I was really was on a struggle to understand this quest of, of truly that I, I didn't really understand. And that is, how much is it of me and how much it is of the Lord? And somewhere along the way, I picked up from one teacher that what we are to do is climb the ladder as hard as we could. And if we didn't make it all the way up the rungs to heaven, then Jesus would come and make up the rest. But you know, here's the problem. I never felt like I had climbed that ladder hard enough at the end of the day. I never felt like I had truly put my all into it, that I could have done better. And so would, good, would Jesus even cover for that part that I really could have done better in? Do you understand what I mean? This haunted me. I, I mean, I, I really felt, all right, I was addicted to Dr. Peppers and Krispy Kreme donuts, you know. And those of you who've heard me before know, I, I truly was addicted to Krispy Kreme donuts. I've eaten a dozen at one sitting. That's bad. I knew there's no way I could go to heaven with a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts in my belly. That's it. And I knew, I just knew that Jesus loved me and I loved him. But on my best day, I could have done better. By the way, on that ladder is Jesus all the way. You know, from the first rung to the last rung. And if I'm only halfway up it, Jesus did that much. You know, I can't do anything. Jesus working in me is the only hope of glory. Jesus, that's what it says. James 4, 17 says, To him that knoweth to do God good, however, and doth it not, it is sin. And sometimes I knew what I was doing. I, have you ever done something that you knew you shouldn't do, but you went ahead and did it anyhow? Do you, you want me to repeat that question? Have you ever done something you knew why you were doing it that you shouldn't do, but you went ahead and did it anyhow? Ask another question. Is there anyone here who never experienced that? Now, the first time there were no hands because you're embarrassed. The second time there are no hands because we're all embarrassed. That, that's the fact. That's the nature of things. And so that's the struggle I had all those years as I'm making my way trying to figure out. And the worst thing about it is, is Romans 6.23 says the wages that we earn by not doing our best is death. That's what sin is. Missing the mark. Romans 7.18. I'm going to just remind you of some passages in Romans because Paul had the same, was wrestling with the same thing that I wrestled with in my teens, in my 20s. I know, Romans 7, 18, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, he says, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Do you, does this resonate with anyone? You know what to do. It's very clear. You know what to do. But you can't seem to find in you the internal fortitude to do it. That's not all he says in Romans 7.15. I do not understand what I do. You understand what he's saying? I do not understand myself is what he's saying. For what I want to do, I do not. You get that? What I want to do, I do not do. It's kind of a tongue twister, isn't it? I just love Paul. <laughs> He's a real guy. Have you ever been there? I've been there. 
I mean, while it's going on, I shouldn't be doing this. I know not to do this. But what I hate to do, he's saying, I do. And here's the worst thing about it. Romans 7, 24. Oh, wretched person that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? You know, th this body is not a body like God originally in intended for us to have. So Adam and Eve, what kind of body did they have? A perfect body. Did you know that Adam and Eve had an, I, I hadn't planned on saying this, but the Spirit's telling me to say it. They had what you call an I prior E experience. That's a big word for simply, they automatically knew what to do and they automatically did it. Sin was repulsive to them. The thought of doing things that we find enjoyable would make them want to throw up, regurgitate. Automatically, they knew the Ten Commandments. An angel did not have to sit down with Adam and Eve and teach them that you ought to not kill. You ought to not steal. Barry, I got this from Dr. Francis. You remember him? That was a basic day, first day. He talked about the I priori experience that Adam and Eve had. After sin, that was lost. And we inherit their nature now since they brought us in, Adam and Eve brought us into a world of sin where it's just the opposite. We don't want to do what we should do. It's the natural thing not to do it. That is the nature of having a sinful nature. When Jesus comes back, this mortal will put on immortality. And we think about that, we say, oh, I'll get to live forever. Oh, it's more than living forever. We will be given again a body like Adam and Eve before they fell. We will automatically want to go to church on Sabbath. We will automatically want to put things in our body that are good for them to keep away from dirt. I'm speaking figuratively of dirt. Filth in our bodies. Oh, wretched man I am, Paul says. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? At Southern, it's a picture of, an old picture of Southern, uh, still looks like that somewhat. Twice a year, they had a week of prayer. And you were required to go to that week of prayer every day. You got two skips out of the week. You skipped two worships. It lasted from Monday through Saturday, through Sabbath. They did it in the springtime and in the fall time of the year. So it was my junior year in the fall time. I had now been at Southern two years. I was seriously considering switching my major to theology. My, my uh, counselor pointed out to me that all the extracurricular stuff I was doing, you know, it was with the ministerial department. I was in their club. I was giving Bible studies. I was going over to a nearby place and helping to start a new church and in uh, my free time on Sabbath afternoon, that's what I did. And in fact, the head of the religion department, I uh, can't think of his name, he was here for a while in this area. He said, uh, he said, you have, he had a, a British accent. He said, Brother Charles, I had two majors. I had a major in communications and theology. And he says, you already are well on the road with communications and theology. Why don't you do two majors? Well, I tried that for one semester and dropped communications. So now I'm, I, I uh, am in the place where I'm thinking about which one do I really want to focus on. And we had this week of prayer. And I did not know the speaker's name. It's in the fall. But I wore a coat, and just about everyone else said, going to chapel to listen to this week of prayer had a coat on. Why did we have coats on? I'm going to just tell it to you like it was. So that we could put our books underneath our coats and slip them in and sit there and, and, and study. That's bad, I know. But you know, I knew not to do it, but that's the thing. I did it anyhow. That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> and so I got through 
those that were looking for such. And I sat there and I was beginning to pour my, my books out and the speaker of the day was introduced, some guy from California, what does he know? He's not from the South. And, uh, <laughs> and he was trying to connect with us and as every other speaker did, he said <clears throat> something like this. In fact, it was this and had a nice listen to listen to voice. He said, hi, y'all. I looked up. Everyone else for over two years had tried to say that. They came from California and from the north and what have you to speak to us. They'd say, they would say it like this. Hi, y you all. But here's a guy that got it right. He said, hi, y'all. And so I looked up. And there was a long pause. And he just stood there, breathing and looking, trying to collect his thoughts. And I'm saying, all right, come on. And then he said something very interesting. An apple tree produces apples because it is an apple tree. But never in order to be an apple tree. Bingo! I said, yes! That's the missing part. Yes! I didn't pull one book out. I sat there and listened. I said, I get it. I know where this guy's going. This is tremendous. I get it. And then he said, a Christian produces good works because she is a Christian, but never in order to be a Christian. Yes! I want to stand up and say hallelujah. This is it. I mean, I just, I was just on fire. Barry, Sharon, were you at that when Morris Fenton had that week of prayer? Yeah, I just, I cannot tell you the relief I had suddenly. It all, woo, came together. Now, I've spoken to some of my teachers since then. They said, well, we, we said that, but you weren't listening. We said it another way. I said, well, you led me to that point. I didn't miss one skip that whole week until the very not last weekend. And the reason I had to miss it is I had a speaking appointment in Birmingham, Alabama, back in my home church. And you know what they heard? Exactly what I just said. I went to Morris Venden on Thursday evening. He said, I'll be in the dean's office if anyone would like to come see me. And I went and I said, Elder Venden, I think this week I have heard my call to be a pastor. Would you mind if I use your sermon, sir? He said, go ahead and use them. I got them from someone else anyhow. <laughs> we took his sermons. They were on the tape, you know, where you used to have a recording, where you have these big, big reels with tapes, and, and we, we would play just a little, and we would type out what we had heard. We typed every word. And we printed that out. There was a revival that took place on the campus of Southern Missionary College that week. I'll tell you, it was wonderful. It was like going to heaven. And we were all talking. The buzz was what, what we had just heard, the gospel, the pure gospel. That a Christian is to produce good works and will produce good works because he or she is a Christian. Because we know Jesus but never in order to be a Christian, never in order to go to heaven. It's the results of it. Steps to Christ, page 44, by another person that has impacted my life tremendously. Ellen White said, There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character and secure salvation, their hearts are not moved by the deep sense of the, whole, of the love of Christ, for their love of Christ. And so we need to spend more time with Jesus, don't we? If I have a problem with a habit, if I have a problem with a feeling, if I have a problem with someone... I need to spend time with Jesus regularly, daily. And the more I come close to him, the more he will rub off on me and I'll become more and more like him. You know, you can, 
you, you can uh, be around people so you start picking up their mannerisms. If you're around a person, you start picking up mannerisms. You start picking up speech. Uh, you can be around a person. I had to work on construction crews, and not that construction crews alone are this way, but the guys I worked with happened to have filthy mouths, and, and they would spit their red man chewing tobacco off the... Uh, off the uh, anyhow, I won't go into that but they spit it. <laughs> I was down below hauling boards, you know. And it was, a, it was a, a rough environment, but that's the jobs I had when I was, uh, for about three or four years while I was in, in school in the summer. And even though I resisted their language, I found it would come to mind sometimes, even though it didn't reach my mouth. And, and I, I talked to the Lord about that. And I, the, the way they would talk, and I talked to them about it. Well, Sharon and I go to a gym now, and the music is horrible, and we go there for exercise. I have the advantage of taking my hearing aids out, <laughs> and I have to be right up there under the, the coach's nose, too, right, Sharon? But Sharon says, this music is horrible. I said, what music? You know, it's, um, but, but it's the world we live in now, and, and so their hearts are not moved by a deep sense of the love of Christ. That's what everyone needs. It's listening to this stuff and using that language. And you can't berate them into not doing it. It's, uh, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. That was what I was doing. It was all about going to heaven, how to get to heaven. And, and the best way to do it, the most secure way to do it before. Now the emphasis is on coming close to Jesus, being Christ-like, and everything else will naturally takes care, take care of itself down to that trumpet will blow and I will naturally open my eyes because I hear the voice of my Savior. So you see, they, uh, such religion is worth how much? And I remember Morris Vinden said, well, maybe it keeps them out of prison. But that's not good enough, really. We can have so much more. We can have heaven. A profession of Christ without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. And I understood that when this was pointed out to me during that week of prayer. Sheer drudgery. I almost became a master guide. Anyone here is a master guide? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. There's one thing. I got everything except one thing. I couldn't read the Bible through in one year. I just, uh, why? Because I was reading the Bible through in order to be a master guide. You know, I've read the Bible through, believe me, in less than a year. But it was because now I was looking to see how Jesus did it, how God would do it, and, 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 and wanting that to rub off on me even, you know. Yeah. It's all about relationship, isn't it? Romans 9, verse 30 and 33. My sermon is entitled, The Apple Tree Parable, and um, it's based on Romans 9, 30 through 33. The Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, Paul says. But Israel, in the 31st verse, which followed after the law of righteousness, have not. Notice that the Gentiles did it one way. They followed not after righteousness. In other words, they did not seek righteousness, but somehow they have attained to righteousness. Did you know in Romans, the first chapter, it says the Spirit of God moves on every heart, even the Gentiles' heart, even the pagans' heart. I have been in India. I have met people. I, my, my taxi cab driver was a godly man. He was a family man. We, I hired him while I was there in, in India for three days. You don't drive in India unless you're a professional driver, let me tell you. And, and so this guy was recommended. The car came along with it, and, and we spent a lot of time together. The third day, we know we were leaving. He's taking us to the airport. And I said, Tikaram. That was his name, Tikaram. Do you know Jesus? And he shake his head. They bobbled their heads there. He says, no, I don't know Jesus. Where does he live? People like that in the world. I said, Tikaram. Jesus, I think, is in your heart, but you don't know it. 
your love for your family, your love for people. I mean, he could have taken my passport and everything. And we left our luggage, everything in the car at times. He could have taken off. That's it. We could trust this man. The Spirit of God was in him. And I think there are a lot of our friends and relatives that may not understand the seventh days of Sabbath. They may not understand a lot about the Bible, but God's Spirit is working on them, we're told in Romans 1. That's what he's talking about. The Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to it. How is that? Because they have responded to the Spirit moving in their heart. But Israel, Israel, which knows truth, which knows about the Word of God, which reads, who, who read it, and even know which day to go to church on. Know the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, which is very important. And yet, something's missing. They have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, Paul says in the 32nd verse, because they sought it not of faith, but as it were by the works of the law, talking about Israel. Not attained to righteousness because they sought it not of faith, but by working, trying to get it right. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone underlined by me. Stumbling stone. What is the stumbling stone? Put that in your mind. You see there in yellow, that word, what is it? Right there. That should have a capital H, actually. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone. What is the stumbling stone? A rock of offense. What is the rock of ages cleft for me? Let me hide my soul in thee. Who is the rock of ages? Who is a stumbling stone? Who is the hymn? It's Jesus all the way. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Romans 9, 30 through 10, 4. Write that down and look at it during your devotional time this week. First, he says in, the third, in, in Romans 9, 30, the Gentiles have produced good works. In the 31st verse, Israel has not produced good works. Why? Because Israel stumbled over the stumbling stone. They could tell you the Ten Commandments. They could tell you which day is the Sabbath. But they could not tell you enough about Jesus. Jesus was an add-on. In fact, they rejected him. And in the, in, in the 10th chapter, in the 3rd verse, he says, Israel has not submitted. Did you know the word surrender is not in the King James Version of the Bible? It's not there. But the concept is there. And here is a place where the word surrender could have been translated in place of submit, have not submitted. They have not surrendered. And I would like to propose to you that one of the greatest challenges, even in Adventism today, is surrender. To be totally surrendered to the will of God in administration, in leadership, all the way down, all the way up. Surrender is an issue. We need to surrender to Jesus Christ to come into a relationship with total surrender to him. Now in Romans 10, verse 4, Jesus, Paul says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Well, Jesus himself said, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, the stumbling stone, that whosoever does what? believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's all about Jesus again. So I'm going to paraphrase this the way that Morris Vinden did in Romans 9, 30 through 10, 4. What shall we say about those non-Adventists who have not tried to produce apples but have produced apples? And also, what about those Adventists who have tried to produce apples but have not produced apples? Why? Because those Seventh-day Adventists tried to produce apples by working harder, while those non-SDAs, who have found Jesus, basically, are grafted into the apple tree, Jesus Christ. Think about that a moment. Just look at it and think about it. 
I mean, that is bedrock gospel right there. That's it. This is what we need. This is what Seventh-day Adventists need. This is what Baptists need to know. Is that Jesus saves. But that Jesus who saves will change our hearts into his likeness. Jesus will take care of it. Romans 9, 30 through uh, continuing. For they, being ignorant of God's way of producing apples, have not surrendered themselves unto first becoming an apple tree. For Christ is the end of trying to produce apples apart from being grafted into the apple tree. And Jesus used the same illustration, but he did not use apples. He used instead grapes. That's it. That's what Jesus was saying right here. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Isn't that what Ellen said earlier? It's worthless. Except he keeps us out of jail, maybe, huh? I love this, you know. Might be a Frankie Belden song, I don't know. I would draw nearer to Jesus. Nothing withholding from him. Knowing he loves to be gracious, I would draw near to him. If you know it, sing along with me. I would draw near to Jesus. I would draw near to him. Fully surrendered each moment. There's the word surrender. I would draw near to him. That's what it's all about. If you have a weakness, if you have a shortcoming, if you have a temper you can't get under control, if you have a bad feeling towards a neighbor, the answer is always one thing. Draw nearer to him. That's it. Draw nearer to him. Oh, you're going to have to make decisions to do that along the way. Let Jesus have full control, fully surrender. That's it. When Christ dwells in the heart, continuing to read Steps to Christ, the soul will be so filled with his love, with joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him. And in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. Love to Christ will be the spring of action now. Not just heaven's worth it. Heaven's worth surrender. Heaven's worth keeping. And heaven is everything. I preach a whole series on heaven. But heaven is a side benefit. The real benefit is a relationship with Jesus, a living relationship with Christ. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle, but the soul must, there's the word, submit, surrender to God before it can be renewed in holiness. All to Jesus I surrender. We sing this song, don't we? All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Why don't you stand and sing it with me? Okay? Let's start with the verse there, I mean the chorus. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Give us a key there. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live i surrender i surrender all i surrender i surrender all all to thee blessed savior i surrender
Jesus, we have been on a journey now, and I pray that your spirit would have made straight the crooked places. My fun, humble and inadequate attempt in comparison, Lord, to what Jesus did when he was here. It may something have gotten through to touch some heart here that needs you in a special way. When I think of the times in my ministry where I've seen lives turned around and they look hopeless, darling. Lord, I've seen it. You know those times, Lord. Do it again now. Please, Father. Touch the heart of someone here today who says, Lord, it's me. Please, God. Touch that heart. Touch the heart of someone who is saying, I like things the way they always have been, and I don't want to change. Please, Lord, change us into your likeness. May you be first and last in all that we do and we think. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening now. Speak to us. Lead us on that journey to the garden of our heart and take us to that weed that silently grows. No one else knows about it. Maybe we don't. Lord, I pray that you will point it out to us. And Lord, give us the power to lift our eyes heavenward to you and to say, yes, I give you permission. Take it. Root it out. Get rid of it, Lord. Please do it, Lord. I surrender all to you. Now I pray that as we leave this place, the Lord will bless you and keep you. He will cause his face to shine upon you and be merciful to you. Until we meet again.